may even take a minute to try to get the Twitter one working because if you recall when we left off last time, there was an issue with it, not on our end, but the fact that Twitter changed their API and therefore wasn't working. So we might take a minute to try to fix that, um, just for laughs, all right? Um, one thing to keep in mind when we're doing these is that these examples are cute, they do their job, but these examples are meant to be, provide examples of different things that you can go and take and expand upon for your own projects. I try to make the projects such that, you know, the stuff that you need to do your projects is somewhere in one of the projects that we've talked about in class. So you can use those as examples, but another thing that's very valuable is being able to go through and read the, ja the, the Java docs, the, the Java documentation for these classes. So, for example, if we were to go online and look up, I, I had a student ask me a question, how do I know what listeners are available on a seek bar, for example. So I can look up Android Java Docs Seek. Or what was what, 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 it's not called? Is it called a seek bar? We'll find out now, won't we? Yeah, there we go, seek bar. You know, it, it's the minute I said it, it didn't sound right, but I guess it is right. All right. Now, if we look here in view in here, we can see. Everything that you want to know in gory detail about the seek bar. Almost too gory of a detail, all right? It's, it's a skill to be able to read this and pull out the stuff that you want. What this does is this shows you, again, sort of the, the ancestry, if you will, that it is a Java object, all right? It is also a Android view object, all right? It, it inherits from that. And it inherits from Android widget progress bar, Android widget ab seek bar, Android widget seek bar. All right, so it extends all those, which means that it's all of those things are, are up above. That's why, if you remember, again, we can do get view by ID and look for it because all these things that we look at, if we were to pull up a text view and an edit text, all those things are views. So that's why that function works because get view by ID returns a view. It returns one of these. All right. So as long as it returns one of these, then we cast it to the proper thing so that we can treat it. At any rate, going back on this, we'll see that there is associated with this an on seek bar listener all right uh, event that that we uh, we have to code and there is if we look through all of the attribute or all the methods there is a set on seek bar change listener and that is what, again, we need to set to respond to the changes in the seek bar going back and forth. So the question I had in lab was like, how do I know what listener to use with this? And that's a good question, you know, because we do have my examples, but let's say, for example, that you wanted to do something with an edit text field or a, an edit text view. What listeners are available? Well, as we scroll through here, we'll see that there is somewhere here.
X view. That's, one, that's sort of the tricky part of this is, is it could be that a method actually exists in an ancestor class. So I was looking under the edit text, but an edit text is also a text view. And therefore my, yeah, on, on, edit, uh, on editor action listener. So we can set listener. So again, if you don't find a method that you're looking for on one level, you can trace up through the hierarchy of the things that inherits. This documentation will become um, unmanageable if they showed every method uh, for every class, including the inherited ones. So therefore, if you're looking for something on an edit text and you can't find it, go up to the text view. So I guess what I'm saying is that these examples are meant to be bigger than just the example that they have. They're, they're meant to, sh to give you ideas on how to implement your own project. So try to take the bigger view when you're viewing these. Okay, at any rate, we left off last time with the Twitter search. And just to review, and again, I strongly urge you to download these from the DEETL site and, and run them on your own and, and even take a look at them beforehand. But if we look at the Twitter searches and run it, We get, and this is a good example because of something I was trying to show last time but wasn't able to. Notice we get a list of all the Twitter searches that we had saved before along with their tags. All right. We can put in a query that we want to search Twitter for, and we can give a tag or a name. Tag is maybe a, a bad choice of words in this case, but we can give a name to that query. And then we can later on go and search it. And if I remember right, we went through the process of being able to um, search for a term to saving a search for then searching for it, but there's an issue with the search given that Twitter changed their API. Now, if I'm not mistaken, we went through the process of entering it in, save, and refreshing those buttons. The one thing to learn from this one is how the fact that that UI expands. In other words, all the UIs we had before had a certain number of controls on it, and that's it. Here we have something that expands, and it expands in a scrollable view. So let's take a minute to look at that and review what we have, and then we'll con continue with the other aspects of this. If we look in the layout, again, we have two XML files. We have our main XML, which is the main um, GUI for this, for this activity. And then we have a new tag view. The new tag view represents the new stuff that we're adding every time we add a search. So this represents those two buttons uh, and checkbox. All right. We have our activity, which, when it's created, we set the content view. We find view by ID for a couple of things, to grab the table that we're going to expand, and to grab the couple of edit text bo uh, boxes. And we set some listeners on the button the click listener on the button. The other thing we do that we'll hit on a little bit later is 
we look to see if there's any saved searches using the shave pre saved preferences. If you remember, the saved preferences is a collection of uh, mapped, what they call it, an associative array. That is, instead of having a numerical subscript, or maybe in addition to having a numerical subscript, you can use a key value to point to an entry in there. All right. On the on-click event for this, on our click listener, on the on-click method, what we do is we do some validation to make sure that they've entered something in. If not, we pop up an alert. And I'm not, the, the logic for the alert is pretty straightforward. You can, you can look at that and see how to do that. But if everything is OK, then we go and we make our tag. All right, and making our tag consists of going in and saving it in the shared preferences and then refreshing the screen. So, We go in and we look to see if it's already in the list. Because if it's already in the list, we know that we don't have to redraw the screen. The button's already there. We go in and we look at our shared preferences and we go into edit mode with it. We, we use a preference editor class to edit our saved preferences. We use that to add to our shared preferences the tag and the query. Those values come, again, from the two edit text fields. And then we go and we apply those changes. If we are editing one, which we haven't talked about editing yet, but if we edit one, we kind of go through the same process. If we're editing it, essentially what this will do is this will simply overwrite what was there before. So given the fact that this is an associative array, the tag and the query, if we update the query, well, then we'll put it back in that associative array with the same tag. If it wasn't there before, in other words, if this original query, when we looked it up, isn't there, then we go and refresh the buttons. And what does refresh buttons do? Well, effectively, we loop through this, and we add the tag buttons, the tag GUI. So if it's a brand new query, the new tag is not equal to null, then we make tag GUI for these buttons. And what does that do? Well, we inflate that other XML file so that we have a table row. A uh, table row isn't associated with any tables. It's just hanging out in space. We then go and we grab pointers to the fields on there. We set some of the values, such as the text. We set a query button listener for it, so it knows what to do when it gets clicked. Then finally, we add that view to the table. And we add it in the proper position. That position we got from the earlier function, and that's where it fits in alphabetically. So this should probably bring us up to date on how to enter and save queries. Now let's look for, I want to do look at two different things. I want to look at how we edit it, and I want to look at what happens when we click the button to actually do the, the Twitter search. All right? When we edit it, what are we doing? Well, we're invoking this query button listener event on click event on this. So what I'm talking about is when I click this button that says edit next to PHP, all right, that button's query button listener event 
fires off, on click event fires off. How did that event get associated with that, a button, that button? Well, when we created the button GUI. When we created the button GUI, we associated the edit button listener with the new buttons that we've created. All right. So each of these buttons have the same listener, all right, which is kind of cool, right? But it makes sense if we think about it, right? Because each of these buttons effectively does the same thing, all right? Each of these buttons effectively does the same thing. In other words, when we click at it, we want to pop up and put the query and the tag back in these edit text views so that we can go in and edit them. So it doesn't really matter that each of these do the same thing because we want them to do the same thing. All right. So what happens when we click that button? Well, actually, it's the edit button listener. I was pointing at the query button listener a bit ago. We actually don't do a lot. We find the row that the button was in. Notice this on click event gets passed an argument. Now, this is part of the framework. This isn't something I coded. It gets passed an, uh, an argument v, which is a view. This represents the view that got clicked on. All right? So, when I click on that button, its edit button listener object goes in the gear, calls the onClick event, and passes to that onClick event the object that got clicked on. That is the button. And that object that got clicked on is in the variable v for view. We then find the parent of that. All right. What's the parent of each of these buttons? The parent of each of these buttons is the table row that it belongs in. Remember, each of these buttons that we created here, we created in a table row. And then we stuffed the table row into this table. So, we get the parent of the button that got clicked. That's what this is saying. V is the view that got clicked, or the button that got clicked. We know the parent is the table row, right? because we know our buttons are in a table, and they're specifically they're in a table row. So we cast that parent to a table row. So now we have an object that points to the table row that represents the one being edited. All right, so if I click on the PHP one, we now have an object that points to this table row, the one that contains the PHP, um, Query button and edit button. All right, so we have that table row. Guess what we can do? Just like we could do a find view ID on the whole GUI, we can do a find view by ID on each part of the GUI. In other words, I'm looking in that table row for the button that has an ID of new tag button. So. Let's, let's play this out. I click on the edit button. Whoops, clicked too hard apparently. I click on the edit button for PHP. It's edit listener, the edit listener, uh, uh, the the onClick listener, which is called the edit onClick listener object, gets moving, and the onClick event occurs. That onClick event looks at the v argument, which is actually the button that got clicked, and finds out what its parent is. Well, its parent is the table row. It then looks in that table row for the thing that has an ID of uh, query ID or whatever the ID is. 
In other words, it's looking for the button here that corresponds to this button. So, when we've gotten to this point, search button points to the appropriate search button in the same row. So if I click this edit, then search button points to PHP. If I click this edit, then it points to the tag MOB web. I grab the tag from that button because the tag that I want to search for is simply the text of that button. So I get the text associated with the search button. That's the tag. I then set the edit field for the tag to that tag. And I find in my saved searches, my saved preferences, the key or, or the value that belongs to that key. So that's how when I go up there, then that gets filled in with the values that I want to edit. Then I'm back to square one. All right. I've just populated those fields. I can make my changes. I click save. The same methods occur as when I'm adding a new one. All right. Now there's a neat little feature here that if you actually edited the tag, it would actually say it would actually keep the old one and add a new tag simply. And you can follow, try to follow through that logic um, after class and see if you can understand why it would do that. Try it where you pull up something, edit the tag, save it. Like if I typed in PHP five and click save. Notice that it didn't get rid of the original PHP, it added a PHP 5. And as sales reps around the world would say, that's not a bug, that's a feature. All right, it was supposed to do that. Right? See if you can follow through the code why it does that. All right, that, that'll, that'll be a challenge question. Take a look at it and see if you can figure out why. Put what up? Oh. Yeah, what I did is I went into here and edited it, and then I changed the tag to uh, something else. So PHP search, let's say. And then I click save. Notice it didn't get rid of the original PHP, it just added a new one called PHP search. So take a look and see if you can have that functionality. That's our challenge question. Uh, if I remember, I will ask it at the beginning of class on Thursday. If I don't remember, please remind me. All right. Okay. So, what do we need to worry about next? Well, let's look at next. Let's look at a couple of different things. Let's look first of all at how the delete works. And how the delete works is well, We have a clear tags button. We create a listener for it. So let's go find the clear tags. We have a clear tags button. We have a listener for it. If we look down for the clear tags listener, We pop up a dialog that asks them, are you sure you want to do this? And if they answer yes, we call the clear buttons method. And what that does is that gets rid of all the buttons in the GUI. And we clear out our shared preferences using the shared preference editor. We clear out the GUI by simply saying, hey, remove everything that's in that table. And now we're back to square one. Let's look what happens when this initially loads. Because when this initially loads, it remembers from the shared preferences the stuff that we previously entered in. So what happens when we initially load it? We look to see and we pull out the shared preferences that we saved from a previous time. 
the last line in the on create event calls refresh buttons but passes a null. The way this is written, if that refresh button gets called with an argument, it means that we want to add a tag. We've, we've just added a tag. If it gets called with a null, that means that we're initializing this. So if we look down, refresh buttons, new tag is null in this case, so we don't look up the old value. And otherwise, we loop through the shared preferences. We get the tags from the shared preferences. We loop through those tags and we make GUI, make the GUI for each of the tags in the shared preferences. So we have really the same function that creates the buttons and it gets called when we press the button and it gets called when the app initializes but the arguments distinguish between those two cases so it either takes and adds the new tag to our list or it simply loops through and creates all of uh, all the ones that are in the shared preferences. Now last but not least, what happens when we click the search button? Well right now, boom, we get an error. All right, let's take a look at that and let's see if we can even fix it. That would be on our search button listener, or actually our query button listener it's called. And what they do is we grab from the button, remember this, re this represents when the search button gets clicked. So what's the, what's the text on the search button? It's the query that we, or it's the tag that we want to run. View V is that search button, is the button that got clicked. So we go and we grab the text from that, and when, then we go and look at our shared preferences to grab the query that's associated with that tag. That is the value that's associated with that key. We then construct the URL that contains from the strings file something called search URL plus the query. And then we go in and we create an intent. An intent is when an application wants to fire up another activity. All right? It intends to, to start up another activity. Go ahead, no, go ahead. The query part of it comes from the button text. If we look, it comes in two pieces. There's like a hard-coded piece that comes from the strings file, and that's the search URL. And then what we're actually querying for comes from the text on the button. Or, I'm, I'm sorry, we get the tag from the text from the button. We use that to look up the query in the shared preferences. If we look at the strings field, The query is search Twitter dot com search comma q equals and then we tack on to the end of that the value of the query from the shared preferences. Well, Twitter just told us that that's the wrong syntax to use for that. There's nothing wrong with our program. We just have to change that string to make it to work. All right. And Here's an interesting thing, is that when we do this intent, notice we don't say open this up in a web browser. We simply start that activity, which is an intent to view a URI, all right, or URL. How did it know to view the browser? What Android does is based on the kind of intent that you are giving it, based on what you intend to do, it picks the application that is appropriate for this. For example, if we had the Twitter application loaded on this, it might actually ask us, do we want to open it up on Twitter or do we want to open it up in a browser? Um, if you've played with an Android device at all, um, if, for example, you have an image, if someone sends you an email image, 
Right, if someone emails you an image and you go to open to view the image. If you have image editing software on your Android, it will ask, what do you want to do? How do you want to view it? And it will give you a couple choices. All the things that can handle images. So the Android operating system sees its intent and figures out what application handles these kinds of things. In this case, based on what I have installed on this Android device, it's smart enough to know, hey, a URL, an intent of, to view a URL, um, you're talking a web browser there. So it opens up the web browser. Well, again, here's where we're forming up the URL in that variable. So URL string contains the URL that we want to do a search for. This is creating the intent. In other words, the URL is really part of the activity, right? What do we want to do? Well, we want to view that URL. And we parse it, again, to get rid of special characters and goofy things like that. Because, um, you know, like if there's things like spaces in a URL, URL shouldn't have spaces in it, so it, it escapes those characters out. So this URI parse takes our raw URL that could contain special goofy characters or spaces or whatever and makes it appropriate to be used as a URL. And then this intent says, I want to view this URL. Go and do that. Go and, and start that activity. The Android operating system then looks to see what are the applications that can handle viewing a URL. Well, at the very least, it can, a web browser can handle that. It's possible you could have other applications. Yes? Um, no. Uh, well, this is a constructor. Yeah, this is a constructor where we say we're creating a web intent object and we are initializing it by giving it a specifics of an action and the URL. Um, Again, keeping in the theme, let's look for here's all the things that we can do. We can view something and we can view a contact. We can view the dialer for a contact. We can view the dialer for a particular phone number. Now, we're not interested in pulling up contacts or anything like that. So, we are going to give a URI. And if we scroll down, I'm sure one of the constructors that a view has after we go through its 65,000 attributes. One of the constructor is intent when we give it a string and a URI. So we can give it an action to say what we want to do to that, what we want to view it, and we're giving the URI that we want to view it for. So yes, that's the constructor. And then this goes and actually starts that activity. The thing I want to say is, is, is the Android's operating system job to figure out who handles that activity. Who is it on Android that views URIs? All right? So if you downloaded some other kind of browser besides a regular default browser that comes with Android, you'd probably be asked the question, do you want to open up with this or do you want to open up with that? All right? Okay. Let's try to figure out what's wrong with this because our query is obviously wrong because we get an error and we say Twitter doesn't do that anymore. And I just did something horrible. So I'm going to undo it. There we go. <laughs> and if we look, this is the URI that we're looking for. That's what we saw when we went and ran this. 
In other words, if we look here, the URI, HTTP search twitter.com slash search comma Q equals, and then we have the value of our query, which is exactly what we have here. This part of it is hard-coded, and the value of the query gets tacked on for that. So let's Google Twitter API search. This deprecated method is da da ba ba ba. If you're like me, you jump down and say, Where are the examples? It never fails to amaze me how when you do um, that's probably one of the options. Let's see. Let's, let's try what they said in the example and I replace that with what they said. Now let's give this a shot and see if it works. Now let's think through this for a second. Um, this is one of the challenges of a developer, right, is what happens when someone that you're using code from changes their code. You know, it could break your code, even though you haven't done anything wrong. This Deedle code is fine, but the Twitter API changed. All right? Well, you have to be able to go and sift through the documentation to find out what it's supposed to be. A good part of Android and all these other things is getting things to work together. So getting this link to be able to fire up in the browser is something important to know, and it's done via these activities. The other example they said was where we could look up a contact and, and bring up a contact from our uh, contacts for there. So having these components talk to each other are important. So you have, sometimes have to dig in and, and read through uh, the documentation to figure out how to make it work. All right? Um, that's the one thing. The other thing, though, the bigger issue is 
This is a refresher on why this is a good idea to have this in a strings file. All right? How many places do I have to change this in? Just the one. So even if I used, if I had Twitter searches in a million places within my application, I would only need to change it once for this particular thing in one strings file. So let's go and let's see if that fixed it. So I'll run as Android application. Quick search. And well, got a different result. I was a little concerned because the search th string has a, a JSON extension, which means it's going to give back a JSON string. But in this case, it gave me bad authentication data. I'm not really sure why it did that. All right. Um, I don't want to take the time to debug it. We did look at and see where we would change it. Um, that may be something else, a challenge for you to do, is to go and update this. So we'll look at, you know, see if you can go in and figure out what you need to change to get that uh, part of it working. Yes? A good rule of thumb would be have no string constants in your application. So any string constant, anything that you would think of using a string constant for should be in the strings file. So <laughs> it's almost, the answer is almost everything. <laughs> yeah, uh, if, like in this case, if we were writing this in another language, you know, we might have there get string or uh, string URL equals quote something quote plus query and eh, don't want to do that you want to um, you want to pull that value from the string file this. I'm intrigued. All right. They say do this. Copy it. Replace
I'll try one more time and then I'm going to give up. With the air, of course, you're not allowed to have ampersands, so we'll replace that with this, and that should be okay. What are you doing? Okay, real Use why it is. Where? All right, there we go. wonder if my one USB port's bad. All right, here we go. I'm still getting an air. All right. Got me. All right. At any rate, we see that the, the problem is the, the hook to Twitter and doing something wrong because it was updated. Um, that would be a good thing to go and try to figure if you feel so inclined. All right. Next application that we're going to look at. We'll start this one today and we'll go into it um, more on Thursday. And the thing, again, to remember about these is that... Um, what do I want to say here? Um, 
look for the bigger lessons. Look for not just what this application does, but look for the things that you can use in your projects. So this is a flag quiz game. Some of these are tough. Let's take a look at it. All right, let's take a look at what we have going on this one. I'll just hold it up. This flag. What is this flag? It's a little hard to see. said a bad word. Shucks. Okay, this this flag, what is that? We, our choices are Samoa, to Tajik, Tajikistan, Armenia. Do we have any guesses? Go say Samoa? Okay, we'll say Samoa. Ooh, look, it shook its head no. Uh, I'm going to go with Armenia. Nope. Kind <laughs> well done. All right, guess the country here. Swaziland, Solomon Islands, Hungary. I think I know this one. I think that's Hungary, right? Yay. Pakistan, yeah. Let's pick a wrong one, though. All right, just so that we can see the, uh, the uh, uh, animation. Nope. Nope. All right. Now, one thing that's different about this, and again, I have to turn it sideways or something, is there's a menu associated with this. All right? So I can select a number of choices, three, six, or nine. So now I change it to nine, it'll show me nine choices instead of three choices. <laughs> All right, makes it a lot tougher. The other thing I can do is I can press and select a region that I want to see. The default is all the regions. All right, and I can turn on or turn off what I want to see. So, you know, for example, if, if uh, you know, kids were studying the Western Hemisphere, and they needed to know those flags. I could say, give me just South America and North America. Or if a kid was studying Africa, they could select and just select Africa. So there's a select region button as well. So what's the new stuff in this? There's several new things on this. One, the animation, the shaking the head no. All right. I was just on an app that did something like that with a password when I tried to enter it in. Yeah. 
And it, you know, I'll tell you, I'm not sure that's a good idea because boys, that burned me up. It's like he's just sitting there looking at you. <laughs> nope. And it's like it, 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 I suppose it makes it more friendly, but man, I, I didn't view it that way. All right. So, but there is a little animation there. That's something new. The menu is also something new. All right. Uh, in other words, we haven't been able to configure any of our apps before to do certain things. All right, so that's something new and that's something we're going to focus on. Um, there was at least one other thing. The animation and the menu. Those are two of the big ones. I'm trying to think if there is a third one. I don't know. We'll have to see. We'll have to see. I'm, my, I'm blanking. Those might, be, those might be the two biggest changes and then we have other additional changes, or not changes, but um, additional extra features in this. So that's how this application behaves. I'm going to let this guy charge for a while in case we need him again. Um, and then we'll go and we'll look at the code. All right. So let's look at the code here. As usual, we'll look and we have our yield manifest file. Nothing terribly interesting going on there. You would you, you would do editing there. You do editing there for a couple of reasons that we'll see later on. You'll do editing there if there are special permissions. Thank you. <laughs> see, they're they're happy I got that one right. You, know. you 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 can do editing to add permissions to that. In other words, if we look, if we go through the GUI, which I, I you know I don't like to do that, but we'll cheat. You can go in and you can set certain permissions in the Android manifest file for security reasons. If, if any of you ever installed an app on an Android device, like from the Google Play Store, it'll ask you, when, when you go to install it, it will say, this application wants to be able to write to your SD card and connect to the internet and blah, blah, blah. It'll give you like a list of things it does. That way you can't say, hey, I didn't know this was going to take up space or hey, I didn't know it was going to connect to the internet because it tells you all in that. That's one thing you can put in the Android manifest file. In fact, if you don't do that, then you won't be able to do certain things, right? Because that's a security thing. The other thing that you would do is if your um, um, application had multiple activities in it. We've been doing mainly just like one activity, you know, one screen worth. Uh, and um, we're, we're popping up things, like we're popping up menus and dialogues and all that, but effectively we just have the one screen, all right? So if we had multiple activities, we'd do that. So to answer your question, for the ones that we've been doing so far in this class, no, there's really no need to, but you would go in and do it if you had one of those conditions. And I'm sure there's other things as well. But those are the two that, that leap to mind uh, for that. If we look in here, we will have, and we might even add this in the other one, uh, but we will have, in addition to our strings file, we have a dimensions file and a colors file. This allows us to go and change background colors or other things um, easily. All right. In addition, um, if we knew, for example, that, you know, there are colors that have cultural meanings, you know, and, you know, we typically think of an incorrect answer as being uh, red. And, and sure enough, that's what they make, the incorrect answer red. There may be other cultures where other colors have meanings and we could go and we could create a resource file so we could do that to make it more appropriate for uh, what they're used to seeing. All right. Um, it might be a stretch in this case but again that's the advantage of doing this is that we can go and create those resources for other environments and it can work. And again with the strings file we can do it for other languages. With the colors file again we could do it for you know, uh, for different cultures. Again, you know, U.S., maybe you have a red, white, and blue screen. Or, or you know, uh, another country, you know, Swiss, maybe it's just red and white, and, and so on down the list. We again have two 
XML files. Any idea why we have two XML files in this case? Let's see if we can, let's see if we can predict why we have two XML files here. One we know is the main one, right? And it's named main. Why do we have a second one? Exactly. Because we can select how many buttons are on the screen. All right? Which means, now you could do this a bunch of different ways, right? You know, I, I'm not saying you would have to, but probably the most clever way to do this would be to have a row of buttons, then, and we add one row of buttons to our UI, we, we, we add two rows of buttons, or we add three rows of buttons. So, again, because we can configure how many buttons, maybe we got enough of a charge where it won't complain, because we can configure how many buttons there are simply by going through the menu item, select number of choices, three, this UI is dynamic. In other words, it doesn't always have nine buttons, sometimes only has three buttons. All right? So because of that, it's very similar to the Twitter search, right? Our UI there was dynamic too. So this should be a hint to you. You have a dynamic UI, you probably have two XML files. One for the main to hold everything, one for the stuff that you're going to add on. All right? And let's look. Our main, sure enough, is what? It's a linear layout. And we were talking in lab, I think, about a linear layout and how that varies from a relative layout. Linear layout simply means boom. <clears throat> you start with the first item, second item, third item, and it goes. We can either orient this horizontally or vertically if it's a linear layout. <coughs> All right. This is probably the simplest. You know, what the heck, why not? Now, I will say there's one thing that, we, that, that I glossed over, I didn't mention in the manifest. If we look in the manifest, this application can only have a portrait screen orientation. So if I go and turn this guy, it doesn't change. Like most applications, if I were to open a web browser and turn it, it would write itself. It would, it would switch from, from portrait to landscape. This one, because the manifest only says that the screen orientation is always portrait, then we can't do that. So if we look at our UI, the fact that it's always going to be portrait kind of makes sense that we're stacking them vertically and, and so on. Uh, what would be there otherwise? That is a darn good question. I, I, I Google things for two reasons in my class. One is to show people that, you know, you don't have to have all these things memorized, that, you know, to, to go and to find the appropriate documentation and to find it, uh, in case you don't know. And the other reason I do it is because I actually don't know. All right? So <laughs> it, it works in handy. So let me Google Android dot screen. Orientation. Yeah, that sounds about right. Ah, had to ask, huh? As as usual, it's never going to be that simple. Where it's one of the other. Uh, unspecified behind landscape portrait. Okay, I know what two of these are. Reverse landscape, I have no idea what that is. Reverse portrait, well, I know there's one way to find out, right? Sensor landscape, sensor portrait, user landscape, user portrait, sensor, full sensor, no sensor, user, full user, locked. I only know what a handful of these mean. Uh, I, I guess if we look through further in the documentation, I would hope that it would have a list of what these are. Just for laughs, let's change it to reverse portrait. Yeah. 
yeah, that's what I'm thinking. From the bottom up, maybe? I mean, that makes sense to me, but who knows? Almost every platform I've worked on, I get amazed at how many options there are to do these million things and all that. But then I also get amazed like how something like really simple you can't do. You know, it, it just seems like that's the case. You know, there's these wonderful platforms you can do all these things so easily, but then you can't easily add one and one or something dumb like that. Okay, it's like when I first fired it up, it was like this, but then I turned it around. Maybe, maybe it did do it upside down. I don't know. That's a good question. Yeah. So there's reverse portrait. I'm going to run it in portrait again. And we'll see what it does. That's all right. I forget to do that sometimes, and you hear some eye ringtone periodically. You know what? When I did, when I changed it from reverse portrait to portrait, it was the other way. So it does something upside down wise. Got me. Now, if we look here in our guess button, we will see that there is not a row of three like I thought. I, I misremembered this. I thought that, th that, that this contained a whole row of buttons. But there's simply a button that gets put on. So if we do three, it will do th you know, one row of three. If we do t two rows, it will do two rows of three, and so on down the line. Now. We notice something, an animation, ooh, the incorrect shake animation. What this does is this is one way to do animations. There's several ways to do animations. This is one of them, all right? This involves specifying how you want to translate different views. Now, notice that nowhere in here does it say what view we're animating, all right? Which means that if we have an incorrect shake animation, we could apply that to several different views within our application. In this case, the flag shakes no if we did it wrong. But we could also do a no for a validation on another screen maybe, maybe a login screen or something like that. So this XML file displays how we're going to change a view when we run this animation. And it consists of these translates. And we can translate any number of things. All right? Associated with each one of these is a duration. So this one, and I think it is in like thousands of seconds. All right? Thousands of seconds. So 100 milliseconds, that'd be like a tenth of a second. Each of these takes a tenth of a second. All right. Now, it's doing a from and a to of the x delta. Remember, in your, from your mathematics, the x-axis is the horizontal axis. That's why it shakes no, because we're changing the x value, uh, the, the x position of it. And we're going from the current position, which you know, starting point is zero, we're doing negative 5% of the screen. So we're going, this is the screen, we're going that way first. We're going backwards first for negative 5%. I believe that's what that would be. We're then going from the negative 5% to positive 5%. So we're going past that. And then we're going back again. Notice each of these have a duration. 
All three of these steps of these animations take a tenth of a second. And each one, and the second and third one have an offset. The reason we do that is so we don't do two things at the same time. In other words, this one we start after a tenth of a second. So in other words, when this one's done, we do this one. This one we start after two tenths of a second because when the first one and the second one are done, then we do the third one. So we could do multiple animations at the same time if we didn't do an offset. Or we could do animations that overlap. Uh, we could go crazy with this and we could have it rotate as it's shaking by simply putting in a different translate in here. So that's one thing we'll play with next time is we'll play with how to change this animation and, and make it do goofy stuff. We can have a blast doing that. All right, so we'll start off doing that next time. I see our time's just about up. Did you have a question? That is a good question. It probably just does that automatically. You know, it, it, you know, the animation runs, we change its position, and then it's back to the position that it, that it was. That's, that's a good question. I, I would have I thought the same thing. Any questions? So we'll have our couple of special challenge questions from today. All right. With any luck, maybe I'll have the Twitter bit figured out, but we'll, we'll see. Um, and then we'll go on and we'll, we'll play a bit with the animations for this, and then we'll go on to see the rest of the app, which again includes dynamically creating the GUI and, and having options. And we'll, we'll see how it does this, uh, it does the rest of the code too, because there's other things that we can learn from this as well. You know, it's not like we've done so many applications that we can't learn from any of the applications that we do, even if it is, uh, even if some aspects of it are repetitive from what we've done before. All right, questions? All right, that's all I had for today.